from the land of sky blue waters, welcome to the Soda Pod. Isha Jerome here, and I'll be alongside Seth Topol momentarily. And I thank you all for joining us wherever and whenever you are listening. Today on the show, we are going to jump right into the hoppy hour as we visit our friends at Drecker Brewing for this week's segment. And then we're going to bring on Seth Topol to talk all things Minnesota Wild. Rat Kuznadinov benched in the third period against the St. Louis Blues. Riley Height just signed by the Minnesota Wild. Injury update for two key players and a little NHL news as well. If you're new to the channel, if you're new to the podcast, subscribe, follow, and check us out on YouTube for the full experience of the Soda Pod, especially during the Hoppy Hour segments. You want to go check them out on YouTube to get the best experience possible from that segment. But hey, if you're a longtime listener and you prefer the audio side, we appreciate you. Give us a five-star rating and a kind review as it just helps us get in front of more listeners. Before we jump into the hoppy hour, I just want to give a big shout out to our friends at Northland Vodka. We just got hit with a crazy April snow dump. So if you're hibernating inside, watching the college hockey playoffs, hell, watching March Madness. Whether you are drowning in your sorrows if your bracket didn't hit or if you're making some great money betting on March Madness and you need to celebrate, we have the best option for you. And that is with Northland Vodka, an amazing local brand run by amazing people. Mark Parrish and the crew there are wonderful to work with and their product is spectacular. We love supporting local here on the soda pod we love drinking here on the soda pod and a percentage of every purchase goes back into the community that's right goes back into local hockey so go support them today if you can't find them at your local liquor store just ask when you get northland on the shelf and i'm sure they will hook you up get you some northland today proud partner of the soda pod without further ado let's jump into the hoppy hour First, I'd like to propose a toast to UMD goaltender Alex Stalock. To Stalock! To Stalock! I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. You know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. You're all hopped out? Oh man, I'm actually going to go for a run today. I don't want to drink any beers. It's way too nice outside. I'm going to go for a run. Dude, I might even go swimming. It's been so nice out. I got to call you back. What the f***? What the hell is this? Wait, what the hell is that? Gift from the gods. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Hoppy Hour here on the Soda Pod. Today, we're diving in to a hoppy, hoppy beer here, courtesy of our friends at Drecker Brewing. What we have here today is the Asteroid Joyride Double IPA. Drecker has some of the coolest can art and some of the funkiest beers. Now they're known for their IPAs and they're known for their smoothie sours. Now I say smoothie sour, it's not really a sour, but I won't get into that right now. I will wait to pick up a few smoothie sours and we will talk about that on a later date, but let's get into this one right here. Unbelievable can art. That's what I know Drecker for. Yeah, their beers are good, but oh my God. 
a mix between what? An acid trip and Iron Maiden. And I say that in all due respect because I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan. I think their album art is some of the best album art in all of music. Y'all were waiting for me to say I love acid too. But anyways, check this out, guys. Check out the video right here if you want a full tour of the brewery as Hoppy produced an amazing vlog and tour of the facility. But before we try it, let me quickly let you know what this is. Like I said, a double IPA coming in at 8%. The malts include pale two-row, flaked oats, cariform, spelt, and white wheat. The hops are Strata, Galaxy, Simcoe Cryo, and they use a house IPA yeast Chef's kiss, it's always so good. We're in the house bar with the Drecker sign and the Drecker cup. Cheers, guys. Oh, wow. Way more bitter than I expected, given its hazy and thick profile. It still hits you just as hard <laughs> the second sip that you take. Honestly, and, and maybe it's just cause like, I'm not the biggest double IPA guy. Now I like them, I'll drink them. For me, there's almost too much of a bite to it given how it's like refreshing after. It's like it smacks you in the face at first and then you get that like rich flavor and almost crisp, refreshing aftertaste. It's something like, I want the second wave of it as I'm sitting in the sun in the summer on a patio or on the boat, but I think it's still just a little too, not necessarily bitter, but tart for my liking as far as like, if I was gonna go pick this one out again, it's not bad by any means. If anything, it's actually really good. If you're a fan of double IPAs, if you like that extra kick, hell, if you're a big triple IPA guy, you're probably just like rolling your eyes at me right now. I'm starting to get used to the bite now that I'm like four or five sips and almost the whole <laughs> beer in. And again, drink responsibly, 8%. Don't just down the whole can like I am for the sake of a vlog. Now that like my palate is used to that almost like aggressive bite in the beginning, I, I do really enjoy the rich citra and crisp flavors. It's very whole. And I just can't stop sipping on it. So I guess it's pretty good. Look. If you're not a fan of the double IPAs, if you don't like that tart bite to a very flavorful IPA, a flavorful beer, then maybe this one isn't for you. But if you like the high percent hazy IPAs that, that aren't super sweet, if you like double IPAs and triple IPAs, then I think you're really, really going to enjoy this one. It's not going to be my first for a Drecker beer, but it's certainly not my last pick. And I'm not holding Drecker to like a high standard like our friend Hoppy does. I'm holding him to the same standard as I do every beer that we're gonna be reviewing and rating on this Hoppy Hour. As far as craft beer goes, within the IPA realm, I give it a solid seven out of 10. Above 500, not necessarily gonna seek it out again, but I don't hate the style. It's good, it's not great, but I think anybody who loves triple IPAs, who seek out this style first and foremost, you're gonna love it. Whew. And if you down it as quickly as I do, if you down it as quickly as I do, you're gonna have to do multiple takes for a vlog because you'll end up bumble in your words. Anyways, shout out to Drecker Brewing. Cheers, guys. <sighs> Don't forget to follow them on social media, like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Before we bring on Seth, I just want to give a quick shout out to our friends at 7th Avenue Pizza, the best damn frozen pizza on the planet. I was on Twitter the other day, bruising, scrolling, and I see people tweeting, Casey's breakfast pizza is the best. Now, I got nothing. I got no issue with Casey's breakfast pizza. If anything, it's actually very good. So I commented, 
second to the GOAT, and the GOAT is 7th Avenue Pizza. There is no pizza on this planet better than 7th Avenue Pizza. I promise you guys that. Available at Kowalski's, hy Holiday Stations, Lunds and Byerly, and more. If you do not see 7th Avenue Pizza in your frozen pizza section at your local grocery store, ask them. Say, what the hell? When you get in 7th Ave on those shelves, and, you have, and if you have any questions about deals at any locations in and outside the Twin Cities, feel free to reach out to Matt and the crew at 7th Avenue Pizza on all social media. They're awesome at getting back to you. They're awesome at interacting with their customers. Get you the best pizza on the planet gets you some 7th Avenue pizza today proud partner of the soda pod on the other side let's bring on Seth Topol of Locked on Wild for our weekly hockey segment here on the soda pod we are back with another wild and NHL hockey segment here with Seth Topol from Locked on Wild guys go subscribe to Locked on Wild on YouTube and and or listen to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from Podcast episodes dropping every single day, as well as videos dropping every day on his YouTube channels, live streams, watch parties, the whole nine yards. Seth, how are you this snowy weekend? Last weekend, we're talking about how nice it is. We're drinking beers outside in the sun. I was going to go like mountain biking and boom, hit with like almost a foot over the weekend. We knew it was coming. We knew that winter was going to get the last laugh. And unfortunately that happened this weekend. Yeah. They're about, I think they're about six inches of snow so far down by me with more expected here tonight. I was looking at the forecast and it's supposed to be like an inch an hour overnight. And I'm like, so that's going to get us into the 10, 12 inch range. And I hate every bit of that, but that's crazy. I've, I've shoveled twice already today. And after this podcast, I'm going to go shovel again. (laughs) Japers. There was nothing this morning, though. We're recording on Sunday, guys. There was nothing this morning in the cities anyways. It was like there was snow all around the cities. And then it just like around 10 a.m. It was like, all right, it's just dropped. It's just, yeah, and it just has not stopped since. But uh, I, I, well, I utilized the snow at least for the earlier segment of the show for the hoppy hour and a little skip before. So uh, I at least I at least got some content out of it. Look at that. Look at that. There you go. YouTuber mindset. (laughs) So we got some content out of that. And uh, a few people on my other channel want me to do the uh, round two of the how Canadian are you uh, snow challenge where you s- literally sit in a pile of snow in your boxers for five plus minutes. Now, I, I hit the five minute mark last time. I am, in fact, Canadian. I told you guys uh, they want me to go for 10 this time. But like, I'm scared of like frostbite. I don't know. I Yeah, I don't know what the I don't know what the cutoff is for that. Maybe I eight minutes. Like- Maybe eight that, minutes is that, that sweet sounds spot. Right. That sounds right. And I think I could do it. Like five, it wasn't a breeze. Now there was a breeze going on during it. So like that, that, that was tough. Um, but as long as there's no wind on it, it's not that bad. Like you, you get right. used to it pretty quick. Like I like, I do cold plunges. I did like polar bear swims back home and look, I, I know Vancouver Island is in Minnesota, but like the Pacific ocean in the winter is still fucking cold. Okay. Like it's still, it's still <laughs> not easy, but uh, anyways, regardless, Winter hitting us with that last wave, and then hopefully it's uh, up and up and nothing but that spring weather moving forward. Um, there's actually some wild news to talk about. I know we were grasping for uh, we were grasping for straws last week, Seth, as, as in regards to wild news. But no, we we were hit with a lot of it this weekend. So let's start with Riley Height signed by the Minnesota Wild, and another reason why I love the WHL is you. This ain't college. You can sign these guys mid-season. They can still play. Now, I don't think he goes back to the Prince George Cougars. Shout out to the Prince George Cougars and the beautiful CN Center in Northern British Columbia. But he has had nothing short of a spectacular season. One of the best players in the WHL and arguably one of the Wild's best prospects. How excited are you for Riley Height? And what are you looking forward to both on the ice and in regards to his spot on this team and in the franchise moving forward? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because he's always going to be paired with uh, Charlie Stramel at the top of last year's draft. And for all the people that were not super thrilled by that pick, I think Heights selection in the second round widely loved by the fans and fun note as well. That was the pick that the wild got for trading Jordan Greenway. Thank so you, that's yeah. Thank you for uh, 
Thank you for missing a team meeting or being late to a team meeting, I should say, against the St. Louis Blues and uh, playing yourself off the team. We'll uh, we'll take it. But I think he represents a skill set, quite literally, that is lacking on this team. He's a great playmaker. He's somebody that I think just sees the ice on a level in which few players on this team currently do. And so it's just another one of those players that we are hoping are going to be able to come in and take one of those top six spots or even those middle six spots. Like if we, if we want to, I think even more realistically set our sights, it would be great if the wild could find some players that could play on line two and line three specifically, because you know, you, you look at Marcus Foligno, Freddie Goudreau, Ryan Hartman being here in the long term. Those guys are probably going to profile more as third or fourth line guys. They should um, be. Let's, they should yeah. be. Yeah. And so you have a real need for second line, third line, and first line guys. And I just would rather this team fill those spots with skill. And Riley certainly got plenty of that. Well, with Duham and Dewar gone, right? So that that could potentially drop those spots, or th- that could potentially allow those players that you mentioned to to drop down to the the fourth line and third line, respectively. And I say respectfully because, like you, Stanley Cup teams have great fourth line and third line players. You 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 need those guys to play. And if you have guys who are skilled enough to, like Felino, score twenty plus goals in their careers multiple times, guys like Hartman who are scoring even more, if you can have those guys in your bottom six and play with that tenacity and get some and, and take those big matchups. I mean, that's, that's worth more than them getting the easier matchups in the top line or, or, or top six and being able to, to get points out of them. And now not always are Hartman and uh, Caprizov and them getting the, the easier matchups. I mean, that's that chess game that the, the coaches play. And that's why coaching the national hockey league is actually so, so crazy. Like, because you have to act so quickly and you have to be so aware of what the other coaches are putting on the ice, who's there. But regardless, like I was saying, if, if they're, if they solidify the bottom six, those names are stuck with them anyways, then yeah, we need room. We need room for Adam Beckman. We need players for Adam Beckman to play with. We need, I mean, who's the will be that nice hybrid where he can kind of play the, sh- a little bit of a shutdown and still provide some skill there in the top six. Yeah. We need those like height. We need those like you're of now. There aren't a lot. There's only two spots, right? Like going into next season right now, there's only two spots. Now, there might be some more if Joe, if a Johansson, if a Goudreau is moved somehow um, this summer. But if not, if if they're icing pretty much the same team, but there's two available spots. I mean, d- does height maybe? Does height force Yurov to play in Iowa? I'll just say, I'll just say bluntly. Do you, do you, I'm just gonna ask bluntly. Do you think he's that good? That he forces Yurov to is there a chance that he forces Yurov to play in Iowa after a training camp? Because Huzendino's got boy. one of those spots right now, so there might yeah. only be one. Ah, uh, God, that's a great question. Um, I honestly, I would rather get greedy and have both of them. I like, love, well, awesome answer. <laughs> I, I would rather get like this is, and this is kind of this is going to be the problem that we run into here next year and probably the year after is now we are fully in this tug of war between giving young players opportunities and continuing to, uh, to try to get these vets spots in lineup. And look, even if you are a team that is going to be taking a, like going with more of the young players, you're still going to have those veterans mixed in. Chicago still has Nick Foligno. Uh, San Jose has veteran players on their roster too. Columbus, same thing. So it's not going to be an entire, like your, your, all of your forwards are not going to be like age 25 or under. That's just not, we saw how that happened. I'll old, you know, Oilers circa 2011 to 2014. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just, that's just not how things operate the thing is just to have that even mix that even balance and so the the riley height contract situation is interesting because if he plays nine or fewer games at the nhl level then his contract his first year slides 
yep. to the following year. So you get the opportunity even as well to give him a taste, see, see where he's at. And best case scenario is that he impresses to the point that you're like, well, we can't take this guy out of the lineup. Like we got to keep finding spots for this guy to play. And that too is something that I just, I kind of wish this franchise would do more of is just allow yourself to be pleasantly surprised by what young players can bring to your roster. We've seen it with who's Nadinov in limited minutes so far. I think he can, I think he can give this team more than he's currently being asked to do. Put him in a position to make you pleasantly surprised at what he, what he does. Same thing with Adam Beckman, same thing with, and maybe not necessarily defensively, but at least in in puck moving uh, capabilities. Same thing with Damon Hunt. Like you, you just if you pigeonhole guys into fourth line roles, and then don't play your fourth line, which I know is kind of leading into another topic we'll discuss. Um, if you pigeonhole guys into those types of spots and then don't utilize them at all, that's that's not helping their development. No, for sure, for sure. Um, just to, for comparison here, Riley Height uh, with the Prince George Cougars of the WHL last year, his draft three put up 97 points, 25 goals in 68 games played. Uh, he was a minus three and he put up eight points in nine playoff games, two goals. This year, 66 games played, 37 goals, 80 assists, 117 points, 42 penalty minutes, by the way. So like uh, eight more than he had last year. And he's a plus 34 versus a minus three that he was last year. And I know plus minus is not the end, the end all be all. But when you go from a minus three and still like a, like pretty much a hundred point player to a freaking plus 34, like you are, you are single-handedly dominant. Like you are bringing the success to this team every time that you are on the ice. Like he, he could, he could do no wrong this year in the yeah. WHL. It's insane. And look, uh, there's like a, an iota of selfishness in me. That's like, okay, well, if he doesn't make the wild, at least he's going back to Prince George. Cause for those who don't know, I actually, I was born on Vancouver Island and then I was, and then I moved to Prince George and actually went to, to elementary school in Prince George. And so my NHL team growing up was like, was the Prince George Cougars. Ham Hughes was on, Dan Ham Hughes was on the team. Dustin Bufflin was on the team. Char was there, but like, I was still, I don't remember him playing. I was too young, but like they've had some, or oh, Derek Bugard was on the team as well in Prince George. So like, all these players that like I love to watch the National Hockey League are actually on that team too. So like, there's like a small. It's like okay, well, if he goes back to a dub team, well, at least it's Prince George and the awesome fans there at the CN Center still get to, still get to see a treat that is Riley Height. Um, but Yurov man has had a hell of a year as well in the pros, not in the WHL, which again the WHL the the best junior hockey league in the world. You're still playing against men. You're still playing against, you know, the, the second best pro league in the world that, that still holds a little bit more weight. And dude, once you got minutes, he, he showed why he was drafted so high. He showed why everyone is so excited about him coming over. He showed why Z literally swoons about him every single day, mm. 62 point or 62 games played, 21 goals, 28 assists. So very balanced there as well for 49 points. And, uh, he, he got three points in the playoffs as well. I don't know what how he was um, like. I don't know how much he was used in the playoffs compared to what, how he was in the season because I didn't watch any of those games. But regardless, like both of them ha like took steps forward developmentally. Both of them are at, at least close to NHL ready. Obviously, yeah. it's going to take a little bit of, of, of time to. I mean, even with Marco Rossi to, to understand the game and everything like that and the systems up here. But uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a fun, fun training camp. It's going to be a fun preseason for Minnesota Wild fans this year because there's so much young talent. Some of those you know, like Damon Hunt, for example, coming up from Iowa. You got who's Nadinov actually in a camp and you got your and height competing for a spot, man. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so much fun. And look, there are some spots on this roster that are legitimately, even if even if the roster spot isn't necessarily there, what a great opportunity for some of these young guys to force the hands of that, the wild. Exactly. Exactly. Like you're you're telling me if a guy like Yurov comes in and just dominates in the preseason, that you're gonna say, you know, we really need to, we really need to see him develop and season in Iowa like these guys are getting close and it's to the point where 
Like I, I salivate thinking about the fact of having somebody that could come into that second line wing spot in particular that Marcus Johansson has held down all season. And just think about the possibilities that having somebody who has offensive, offensive upside getting that spot and somebody that can give you multiple shots the oh, yeah. stat that I the stat I keep pulling because I check it on a game by game basis is Johansson has played it's it's around 70 games this season. A couple of those games have been on the third line, but most pretty much by and large, he's played second line minutes. He has had 38 games. Actually, I think it would be 39 with the St. Louis game. He's had 39 games in which he's had one shot or fewer. That's 39 games. That's 39 unacceptable, games. man. You could just you can be doing so much better in that spot. Let's let's say you get some young rookie who gives you and I know there are other analytics that tell the story much better, but you don't shoot the puck, you don't have the chance to score. Like it's that simple. You don't, yeah, you don't set up rebounds or anything like I get that's not everyone's role to be offensive all the time, but at the end of the day, even those players by accident are dumping it in and hitting the goalie pads at times, dude. Like, come yeah. on, seriously. I'm not, and that's a little tongue in cheek, but like, it, it's, it's true. <laughs> like, and, and it's, we, we see it with, we see it with Rossi. I think he had six or seven shots against the blues. And so like, it's contagious. Like when you are a young player and you start to especially score, you want to shoot the puck more. Like you want to be more active and involved in the offense. And so you put somebody else in that spot and they can let it rip. I think you got yourself a, uh, a pretty decent second line. Oh, absolutely. Uh, speaking of the St. Louis Blues game, a little bit of a heartbreaker there as it was a close one. Wild losing overtime. I actually went to the NCHC final game after that, and there were still Blues fans celebrating on the street down there in St. Paul. And I was, uh, man, I was getting, I was getting so irritated watching their <laughs> smug looks. Let me tell you, one one of the one of the best jerseys in the, or one of the best jersey logos in the National Hockey League for me because like I'm a I'm a Blues guy in the music note. It's just it's just cool how they like. I've always liked that one. I've always liked that one. Yeah. But uh, so the jerseys were nice. It was it was the smug look on the on the people who won in overtime that that, that 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 didn't rub me the right way. Let's just say that. But anyway, speaking of that game, um, do you think it was the correct decision by the Minnesota Wild to essentially just bench who's Nadinov in the third? For me, I understand it. Still learning the systems. So like it, it's a it, it was a close game. You want to rely on the guys who you've been riding with all year, and furthermore, you don't want you don't every you don't everybody just cuss this kid out for being the reason that they lost if, if something happened. But uh, on the other side, like you mentioned in the opening segment, he's actually brought a lot of positive to this team. He's actually been very good in the two way game. He's been very good at stealing pucks, despite him not necessarily shooting as much as Rossi every game. So back to the original question, was it the right decision? Cause they lost the game. Maybe they would have won if he forced a takeaway or, or two. It, I'm, I'm just going to flat out just point blank say no, because who else was on who's Nadinoff's line? It was Freddie Goudreau and it was Marcus Foligno. So you're going to, you're going to single out. And I know by and large, the entire line, didn't play a ton, but then Felino got 13 minutes, 40 seconds. Goudreau got just under 13. Like th this is something that has happened with this team too often. Even before and, Hines, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. This is not like, this is not a John Hines specific problem. Dean did this all the time. Like you're penalizing a rookie because you are in absolutely have to win at all costs mode. And this is like, these are some of the little things that add up during the course of the season is you, you end up just running your first and second lines into the ground because you are having to try to get goals as much as you can it, look like it does not do him any, like you're not serving his development at all by playing him seven minutes. I know that line was a minus three. It was a rough matchup for him, but put him in positions to succeed like that. That's that is, I think 
where the thought process gets a little backwards. Put the young players in positions to succeed as opposed to be worried that they're not going to be worried that they're going to make mistakes. And so therefore then try to hide them so that those mistakes don't end up costing you games. And it's, it's more like um, in our face. It's more loud. It's more extravagant with players like Beckman, who is a, he's more of a top six guy. He's mm-hmm. not a defensive first guy. Whereas who's going to do know if I get it. You can kind of, bury him down there because he can play that game. Are you getting the most out of it? Absolutely not. But the fact that they do that to those players like Adam Beckman and expect that they're not going to make mistakes in a role that they've never really played, especially at at this level, the most important level, the highest level, that is the National Hockey League. That's what rubs me the wrong way. Well, and are you going to penalize Matt Boldy for the mistake that he made in overtime that ended up costing you the game where... All he has to do is camp out in front of Jordan yep. Bennington long enough for him to freeze that puck. And you maybe you might be able to come away with an overtime win. But by not just just thinking it through, by not standing there for a second, he allowed Bennington to kick the puck out and the Blues come down to the other end and score. Are you going to do anything to him for that mistake? Which I would argue impacted the game more than anything that Murat Huznadinov did. Yeah. I mean, he'll probably get an earful, but I don't think his minutes are going to be cut. No, not at all. And that's like, this is, again, you're, you're relying on two lines to wheel you into the playoffs, which is all the other things. In addition to this, just a tall mountain. And you end up paying the price for it at the end of the season. I'm scared to look at Money Puck because when we when I jumped on your show on Friday, which again, by the way, as you can hear me on Locked on Wild every Friday, again, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, they had what, like a 6.4% chance to make the playoffs. And now I, like, I'm scared. I'm scared. Like, uh, you can tell me if you want, Seth, but like, I, I might just cover my ears here because I, I think it's like I, you said it's a tall mountain to climb now. I, I don't even think it's possible. Like, it's Everest for, uh, it's Everest for a five hundred pound man at this point. You know, like they, they ain't getting over that hump. Yeah, I don't understand this at all because they technically are giving the Wild a better chance to get in than St. Louis, who just beat the Wild again. Uh, Seven point two percent is the latest odds for the Minnesota Wild to make the playoffs. Maybe because they got a point in the game because of overtime? That could be. That's probably... Okay, so regardless, it's around the same. It's around the same. Yeah. Okay, it's not that bad. We'll say a a, a 300-pound man trying to climb Everest. So. Vegas is at 88.5% to get in. Honestly, we could rip on them for being only 88, not 90 at this point. What a bunch of losers. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah, Nashville, Nashville's at 99.6. Dude, you know what? Credit where credit is is due, man. I did not expect them to be get that good this year. We won't go down this entire rabbit hole, but like they it's crazy that that uh, that team since they s- alongside the wild, since they came into the national hockey league, they have been a defensive first team with multiple coaches, multiple systems, multiple now multiple GMs, and there's still that like if you want to beat us, you have to like literally wear us into the ice. Like there's yeah. there's like we they're I mean and they had great luck of having two back to back superstar and I and I mean superstar goalies in Pecarina and their like first big wave um when they had some success in like the mid two thousands and you know basically twenty eleven onward into where until Soros took now the baton and he's running with it. And I think he's the best goalie in the National Hockey League, like bar none. Yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy because you look at what they have statistically, and I know because I was just looking at this. Uh, they have two players with 20-plus goals, Philip Forsberg and Ryan O'Reilly. They've got Roman Yossi with 18, Gustav Nyquist with 19. Uh, the Dallas Stars, by extension, have six players on their roster with 20-plus goals. The key difference, though, Nashville doesn't give up goals. Correct. They, they play very, like, even last night, what, they won one nothing, right? that's the thing yes. it's so hard to score on them and they only need one if they get one it's like oh shit we have to get two against this team like uh, it's it's going to be very interesting to see them in the playoffs 
Yeah, the current goals against, which is 206, is wow. one, two, three, four, fifth best in the Western Conference. That's amazing. Behind Winnipeg, behind Vancouver, behind Edmonton, behind Los Angeles. Um, yeah, fifth best in the entire Western Conference with 206 goals allowed. That's amazing. That's amazing. But anyways, we won't glaze uh, Nashville anymore here because the listeners are like, come on, boys, come on. Don't do this to us. Don't do this to us. Um, some positivity. Joel Erickson Eck uh, had a full practice on Saturday. Now, I read an article by the Pioneer Press Saturday morning right after the practice that said, you know, maybe, maybe there's a chance uh, that he gets the game. But uh, no, he wasn't able after full practice to get in the St. Louis Blues games, and that's okay. Honestly, if he, if he wasn't, you know, ready yet, I would have rather him, you know, th- come back when you're when you're good. Um, John Hines has had, you know, good things to say about his last practice and his, well, recovery from his lower body injury. He said he's been, he's made outstanding and significant progress. Um, he was obviously out there for a full practice. We want to make sure that he gets back and he's truly ready to get going. So I imagine me personally, Seth, and and you're a little bit more dialed in, so I'll ask your opinion after this. But I think maybe he sits one more game, and then and then he's back, and the and and he's back with like the full minutes, the full role, like you're not just easing him in back. Now, if he plays the next game, probably diminished minutes, probably diminished role. But uh, what are your thoughts? Do we see him in the next game, or, or do we do do we see him sit one more time? I think we'll see him on Thursday. I have kind of a thought that he was held out of the Blues game because. The tendency for the that game was going to be what this is Tough. this is kind of <laughs> counterintuitive to what you need to be doing at this point in the season, but I think he was probably held out of that St. Louis game because of how physical that matchup was going to be. Yeah. Um, and then you get him back for San Jose, a game that you should be able to handle, although that that last matchup against the Sharks was anything but until Kaprizov took over and decided to just win it himself. Sharks just playing with house money right now. You see the game with them and the Blackhawks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, roller coaster game, but they they were able to get some uh, goals there early. Yeah, it's it's tough at this point for these teams that are just completely out of it. Like you're just playing out the string. If you're a veteran player, you're trying to impress for another contract. You're playing for bonuses. Those who are like you know those who. I have like the fine print of, you know, you get 15 plus assists for a defenseman and we'll give you an extra like, you know, 20 grand or 50 grand or whatever it is. That's what they're playing for. They're playing for those bonuses right now. <laughs> yeah. And they're like 40 points through 70 games. Oh, oof. Unbelievable. Oof. Yeah. Um, Jonas Brodeen is uh on the mend as well. And he's getting closer to come back. He didn't practice on Saturday, but Hines is confident that he will be back if not in a week, at least for the final 10 games of the season for that final 10 game stretch. And he's also very happy with, uh, with how he's progressing and, and nothing's really lingering. They're like, he's, he's getting healthy. And when we bring him back, he should be good to go a little, probably, you know, a few bruises there based on just all the, all the shit that he's taken this season. I mean, it was, it was a tough year injury wise for bro Dean and and obviously also, you know, Spurgeon who's, who's been done for a little while now who usually take the load uh, for this team. But uh, I think it'll be so good for him to come back because Brock Faber right now is he just needs some, he needs some help, man. He needs some help. And it's, and I can imagine like we saw it post game. Like he's, he's showing frustration rather than just like pure professionalism, you know, the, the generic hockey answers like, no, he's fired up and he's like, he's trying to will this team to a playoff spot. And he's the, in my opinion, he's, Right there with Caprizov is the best player on this team, and he can't do it alone. He can't no, do it alone on the back end. He he can't. And you know this is why this is why the Calder debate is so funny because he, all respect all respect to Connor Bedard, but what is he being asked to do? He's being asked to score goals. What is Brock Faber being asked to do? He's Carry the a team in the playoffs. Number one defenseman. He is playing number one penalty kill. He is drawing the number one offensive player from the other team as his most common assignment. Playing power play. Like he just, he is just doing everything that he could possibly do. And I'm pulling up the number here now. 
Um, had a, f- a fan, a locked on wild listener, tip me off to this. And I knew he was in the top five previously, but he is third in the NHL amongst anybody in minutes played. He's got 1,781 minutes played in 71 games, trailing only Rasmus Dahlin and Drew Doughty. And I was going to say, and Drew Doughty. That's insane. And he's, he's, he, and you know what's uh, crazy is I've been monitoring that stat all season as well. And he's, he's been at three a couple times. He's gone no lower than five. Right. Yeah. And Dowdy's always been number one because Dowdy's been like number one his whole career. Um, shout out to Drew. You love to hate him, but you, you can't knock him for, for how hard he plays and how lo- and how much he plays there on the ice. That's incredible for a rookie in the National Hockey League. Yeah, and it's not like he's it not like it's not like he's just a minute munching defenseman. Like he's got 40 points on the season. He's got seven goals. He has played 41.2% of possible ice time for the Minnesota wild this That's season. Crazy. It's insane. Like when you, when you hear it and you all are hearing it right now, some of you are seeing it on YouTube. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Wow. He's I just, so good. He's so good. Like again, we're, we're spoiled. We're like, oh, he's the best player on the team. Kirill Capri's obviously, you know, superstar, obviously the wild wouldn't be anywhere without him, but like favors right up there. Like you have to have a top scorer. You got to have a top center and you have to have a top defenseman. And you need a top goalie, but to win a Stanley Cup, and at least they have two of those four pieces. But uh, yeah. need a little bit more work at center. Um, four point five one block shots per sixty minutes. One point three five points per sixty minutes. Um, eight point five nine shot attempts per sixty minutes. Just like I, I could How go on. How is there on. a debate? How is I there could... a debate? It, Honestly, I, for for a call, like it, it, it makes no sense if if you look at it like that. If you even do some research to those stats and and let alone watch all the games like we do. That's nuts. Blackhawk fans are out to lunch, man. All those trying to troll us on Twitter, they're all out to lunch. Yeah. Like it's I I just I can't even do you value points or do you value the overall it, like Bedard is a mind. Points a, for a defenseman. He has good points for a defenseman too. So I feel like you can't even just you can't even use that argument against him because he does have the points. Bedard is a minus minus thirty seven <clears throat> on the season. That's like historically bad. Because the other thing too that was pointed out is that Chicago's goalies this year have essentially been league like league average. So it's not like they're giving up a ton of goals over what you'd expect to where it's like, oh yeah, the goalie had five awful goals that he gave up. No, they're playing it. They're playing league average. So that makes that number look even worse. hundred percent. And and how I look at it is like Bedard is everything we thought he would be coming into the league. He's going to develop more of a two way game. He's going to, you know, there's going to be more pieces that develop around him that the, the Chicago Blackhawks build around him so that he can be that, you know, Connor uh, Connor uh, McDavid esque type player. I just watched Roadhouse, so I almost said Connor McGregor. <laughs> um, he, he, like that's gonna happen. He's going to get. He's gonna be at one point probably the best player in the league. Yeah, but in his rookie year, and this is a rookie award. When you have a rookie, I mean, it's, it's not Faber's fault. He's not a fucking forward, right? He's coming in. Whoops, as, I'm getting so fired up here. I'm knocking off my mic. Coming in <laughs> as a defenseman, doing everything asked. By a player in that position. Connor yeah. Bedard is not, you know, checking the box for, for his two-way game, even an average two-way game. Whereas Faber is, like we just talked about there, is exceeding in every single thing that not only a rookie defenseman needs of his caliber, but a top defenseman in the National Hockey League. So that's why there's no debate, man. There's, there shouldn't be a debate. There shouldn't be. It, it, seems, it seems pretty clear-cut, at least to me. Um, and, and you like, let's just end the insanity. I did want to, I'm going to see if I can quick pull up one other number that I wanted to try to further, um, further well, drive this home. And, and while you're looking that up, I gotta say for anybody who bet on favor to win the Calder award at the beginning of the season, I w- let us know in the comments, what odds you got him at, because like, I, I just want to congratulate you. I just want to congratulate. Cause even, even if, even if, you know, he gets robbed and Bedard gets it. Like you still had the co- the cojones to drop some money on that, and I respect that more than you know as a fan of uh, of defensemen in the National Hockey League. 
Um, like Faber has 134 blocks, 59 hits, and in 71 games, he has 33 giveaways. Bedard, 22 blocks, 43 hits, and he has 47 giveaways. Um, what was the? It was I was looking for point shares, um, just to try to. Oh, here we go. So Bedard has 4.2. Offensive point shares and 0.4 defensive point shares, which they say adds up to 4.7. Two plus four is six. Last time I checked, so four they're, points. They're fixed. rounding up. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to be generous. Um, and for Faber, oh come on, put this in an easy spot to find. Faber has 2.3 offensive point shares. 3.9 defensive point shares for a grand total of 6.3 point shares this season. Like that shit beautiful than a motherfucker. Stop the count. Wow. Yeah. Let's hope that uh, some of these journalists and writers do their homework, man. And don't just go on hockey DB like us plebeians, honestly, because <laughs> I feel like some of them do. I feel like some of them do. And and I, I almost feel bad for Russo in that, like, people are dragging him through the mud. Like, oh, it's just because it's Minnesota. And it's like, no, dude, it's no. not. We just it's laid not. out a bunch of different ways in which it's just, it's not even a comparison, honestly. Yeah. Um, Speaking of defensemen, what, what a segue, Seth. What a segue. Uh, speaking of defensemen, I had the pleasure of going to the NCHC finals. Uh, again, we're recording this on Sunday, so I went last night where Denver played Omaha, and I got to take a good look at Rieger Lorenz, a uh, 19-year-old out of Calgary, Alberta. By the way, a ton of Calgarians were in that game. Denver's goalie, there was two guys from Omaha. Um, but anyways, yeah, so sh shout out to Calgary, Alberta. You got... You you were well represented in the NCHC finals. And first of all, before I dive into Regal Lorenz, before I dive into a couple other notable players from that game, I have to say, like, congratulations to everybody there. Omaha making it incredible in, in their own right. They played super hard. And in the first period, they actually were starting to pepper Denver. They opened up the scoring. Minnesota boy Brock Bremer got the first goal of the game. So, even though most of the people in the audience were there kind of rooting for Denver, I would say the majority were rooting for Denver. Everyone stood up and we just were excited for the Minnesota boy. Um, the second biggest cheer, by the way, was Buddy, who was just a few rows uh, next to me who passed out and they put the whole like popcorn and beers like that went on the Jumbotron and that was the second biggest cheer of the, of the night, by the way. So uh, I'll, uh, I will definitely insert that. Uh, <laughs> That's a tough scene. <laughs> insert that into this video here so you can look at it right now. But uh, Regal Lorenz looked great, man. Now, was he the fastest skater out there, north-south? No. But did he use his, like, because he, he actually, like, he was bigger than I thought he was. He used his uh, size well, and his and his angles and the way he carved the ice was actually really nice. So his, like, side-to-side -side movement he had, was really good. His quickness and alertness and how he didn't jump the gun on plays, but made the right decisions when he made those quick decisions was awesome. I didn't see him carry the puck into the offensive zone too much because, <laughs> let's be honest, uh, the Booyam brothers, uh, Z Booyam and um, and his brother Shy, they pretty much took care of that that game. And I'll talk about those two brothers here in a sec. Omaha guys, and when he was in the offensive zone, he was kind of that second pass after Z brought it in. And if he couldn't find the shot, if he circled around the net. Man, if Lorenz was out there with him as well, or if they were uh, out there together on a change, like he was the second option and his shot is very, very good. And his awareness out there defensively and offensively was great. He very much is zone. He got involved in the play too. So Minnesota wild fans, uh, Regal Lorenz look good. And he's only 19, 28 points, 15 goals this year. 
like yeah. to have somebody that can help out offensively and defensively and just knows when to step into the play and uh, and help out is that that is super appealing to me. My only concern was, and again, these were you know the the two top teams in in that division, the NCHC. So they they were good. They were very good teams. Everyone seemed fast. He wasn't the fastest player out there. Now I'm not saying he was slow, but I'm saying like there were there were guys on Omaha who were beating him at times for for the puck and things like that. Yeah. If I'm gonna be fair, um, his <laughs> he wasn't the fastest guy out there on the ice. But again, maybe that's something that you can uh, work on a little bit in like conditioning wise um, as you develop again, he's still so young 19 and his progression from last year. Now, no, he's, he was given a lot more opportunity this year to play. So that's obviously going to reflect in his numbers. Um, he had nine points last year, um, 20 penalty minutes. And he was a, he was a, he was zero, right? He was even as far as plus minus went, whereas this year took a jump, right? Two goals to 15, and he was a plus 20. So he was obviously more, he was used more in an, not necessarily an offensive role, but he was out there when this team was getting rewarded offensively. And he was, like I said, was involved more in like the rushes and things like that as well. So that's just great to see. I could see him probably having one more year at Denver. Sure. Um, You know, so yeah, that was good. Anyways, uh, the next thing I'll talk about quickly before we have one more topic um, NHL wise, before we wrap up the show, Zeev Booyam, man. What projected to go anywhere between what, like eight and fifteen, right now? I see, and I know that's kind of a big stretch, but it, the, the the gap will will close more as we get closer to the draft. He could be there when the Minnesota Wild pick Seth, which is that. That's what I'm saying. Anywhere between you know that ten to fifteen range for the Wild, that 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 they should be salivating, you know, thinking thinking about the, the the draft coming up in the future and him possibly being there because we were just talking about getting more defensive prospects and defensive options in the door. Now, he is... I think Mateo will say Quinn Hughes light in his skating because in my opinion, Quinn Hughes is one of the best skaters in, in the National Hockey League, if not the best skater in the National Hockey League. But yes. he's a, he plays a similar type of game. He's a rover. Like, oh, he's everywhere on the ice all the time. He is dict He's dictating the play. It, more so, Zeev was dictating and setting up the plays and leading the rushes than even the, the, the centers, the top centers for Denver. Like, the system Ooh. ran through him, which was really, really cool. And, and even if the, he had to come back, circle back, or pass to a forward, they would pass back to him in the neutral zone, and he would set it up again. Dude, no one could catch him. I, I, I was waiting for someone to catch him. No one could catch him. Like, it, it was, it was, his skating is unbelievable, dude. Gonna have to uh, put that on the top of my list then because, like, we need to... The Wild should strive to try to do what the Buffalo Sabres have done and build, and I, I know it takes a while to do that, but that blue line that the Sabres have is so young and so good. You just added Bowen Byram to it. Like, that should be the goal is a bunch of dynamic defensemen who are capable of contributing offensively. Um, and, you know, you've got a good start to that with Faber, but you're going to need more guys. And so my my number one position for the Wild in this draft is to grab a defenseman. And I just hope that one of those guys, by him would be great if he is still available. I just hope that somebody falls to them at 14 or wherever they end up hopefully a little further up be would love for them to be able to get right up to about 10 or 11 yeah because but. you take him you take him if he's there oh 100 um, and, and it's not like he's just an offensive uh defenseman like oh who's the um, that sunquist kid that the chicago blackhawks drafted i think like four or five years ago now and they said like incredibly high ceiling but incredibly low floor because there's there's actually like no defense to his game at all and has he panned out yet? No, he hasn't panned out yet. So there's always that risk. His defensive abilities, though not the most physical, he's six feet tall. It's not like he's a small guy. Right. And and I mean, we'll, we'll, I'll just quickly talk about his brother in a sec here. He's fucking massive and he's a beast out there. He's a Red Wings uh, prospect. But he, I think, got three. He picked three guys' pockets in the game. First period and I think twice in the third. And 
his his defensive awareness is incredible. And his defensive partner wasn't like this big oaf of a guy who stayed back. Like, no, he was a pretty good skater as well. I don't remember who was off the top of my head, but just like taking some mental notes of of the, the type of player that his defensive partner was. Yeah, he was the backup guy, but like he could keep up with him entering the neutral zone as well. But yeah, man, he was defensively aware. He was out there for key face-offs uh, when Omaha got some good breaks in that game. Um, I don't think he played much on the penalty kill, but I wouldn't be surprised if he got looks on there this season as well. He's a freshman, 48 points, 11 goals in 38 games, man. He's a plus 32 this season. Yeah cooking he i like is it very good like unbelievable and his brother who looks exactly the same as him by the way it's it's scary they <laughs> uh shy Buyum, this is his third year in denver like so he was a second rounder for the detroit red wings um not as offensive yeah he's gonna put up numbers in, in college he's gonna get those secondary assists he is a beast in the defensive zone man absolute beast so you know this this is pie in the skies but like you know Maybe he's not in Detroit's plans. The wild pick up Zeev, and in two, two, three years, Zeev goes, Hey, you know, there's my brother's a pretty good defenseman, a la, you know, Jamie Ben and Jordy in Dallas. I'd be good know. with that because Why they, not? I, they, didn't, they didn't play on the same pairing, so it's not like, Oh, I need him to play on the same pairing. It's, it's just another option. There's just another yeah. option there. No, not that's like getting greedy, but no, Zeev, man, Mateo was hyping him up to me and showed me the highlights as we were. Uh, shout out to Mateo who uh, hooked me up with tickets to that game. We were we were watching highlights and stuff before the game, and he was just like, "Man, just just keep your eyes glued on. I mean, watch Rieger, watch a couple of these other guys, but just make sure your eyes are locked on him, uh, on a potential locked on Wild." Hey, there you go. That wasn't I the be- best. I tried. I tried. It, it works. <laughs> I I will I will allow it, and I will accept it. There you go. There you go. Then the penalty delivered to Sean Barrett. He receives a minor for holding. And Omaha is number twenty-two. Jimmy Glenn here receives a minor for booking. Time of the penalty is 7.38. Barron's holding minor and coming to Glenn. Booking number 73. Last thing here, Seth. Last thing here. I want to give a big shout out to uh, TJ Oshi, the Minnesota boy, hit 1,000 games in the National Hockey League, man. I mean, like I said, Minnesota boy, Olympic stud, Stanley Cup champion. And you know what? Though he's getting towards the end of his career, I respect that guy so much because I I, I read a couple articles midway through the season that he's actually been playing through so much pain, dude. His back is is destroyed. He has to come back to Minnesota every couple months to get treatment because he has a oh. specialist here that does better work than even the capitals doctors. And that's not a, uh, that's not throwing any shade. At the capitals doctors. He just, he has a specialist here. He's been going to for a while. He knows him well. And it, it's one of the best, uh, you know, back specialist doctors in, in the state, let alone uh, the cities. So obviously he's going to come back for treatment whenever, whenever he can, but he's been coming back yeah. every, every couple months, dude, for treatment. He had to, he can't play golf anymore Sweet. because he can't swing. And he's still going out there to fucking war every game as these Capitals are fighting and inching their way into a playoff spot. Or at least, you know, they've been in and out of it all year. But what an absolute warrior. I've always loved TJ Oshie, even when he was with the Blues. Um, I've never seen a guy look so classy drinking a beer through his shirt celebrating a Stanley <laughs> cup win. And what a year that was too, for him uh, when, when the Washington capitals won their Stanley cup. I mean, being a Minnesota yeah. boy yourself, Seth, I mean, what, what, what do you have to say about TJ Oshie? He's an icon and look back injuries are no joke. Um, I, one of the classic examples that I'll bring up recently was uh, when Jim Tomey played for the Minnesota twins, when target field, like first opened. That dude was going through like to to steal from Dave Chappelle. He was going through like a full backyotomy every game to get himself in position to be able to play. And it's still it still is barely enough. So like it's just it's unreal. And that Caps team like you want to talk about Minnesota ties. How about uh, how about Lakeville's own? Charlie Lindgren leading them and just 
just doing the thing here um, in March, seven and three in March. And so that Caps team, like Ovechkin's got eight goals in his last five games. He's starting to heat up. You never know. Yeah, you never know, dude. Hey, look, TJ Oshie's as good as he is, as good as he's always been. He's not putting the team on his back right now. That's not what's hurting his back right now, right? His, that's wear and tear throughout uh, a very long career as, you know, kind of that new era power forward, right? Yep. Alex Ovechkin right now, though, he, I mean, shit, he might have to see Oshi specialist because he is putting this fucking team on his back, dude. Heater. And, you know, came out of the gate quite slow, quite concerning. Everyone saying, you know, two months into the season, he's not going to catch it. It's over. He's going to retire next year. Bro, he's 46 goals away. Unbelievable. He is a season and a half at this pace. He's one season if he's back to old Ovechkin next year. And, and it's not yeah. even like, it's not like he's going to, because he might still slow down a little bit. If the Caps put guys around him, no Kuznetsov, no Backstrom this year, and you're wondering why he's not getting the looks, he has to do everything himself, dude. Right. He's just, and, 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 and he's been doing that these last few games. We've been seeing shades of the old Ovi. Like there's been, there's been times where he's actually started skating like the fucking wind, like the 22 year old Ovi. Now, is it sustainable throughout the whole game? No, but if he could just, you know, cut the Dr. Pepper from his diet on the bench for, for one year, Ovechkin for one more year, Alex, just cut that, go on a little bit of a, of a better diet next year. And just really try to remain injury free, man. I I think there's a possibility that that he makes it. Well, and let's say he keeps this heater going this year, and he gets himself ten or twelve more goals before the season is done. You then know, you only then need I'll, just a little bit more than thirty next year, yeah. right? Then you're on a thirty goal pace, and you are in a like last ride situation. That imagine how fun that would be to be like Alex Ovechkin versus Father Time race to. Gretzky are you kidding me that would write that the stories are going to write themselves yeah yeah 26 goals right now on the season one one of his lower I mean, it, it, it might go down to be one of his lowest years he got 32 and 79 games in 2010 and he got the uh, 38 in 2011 2012 I'm not going to count obviously the the shortened season he got 24 goals and 45 yeah. goals, whatever he was on pace to do excellent things, but uh, 58 points in 68 games right now. And yeah, the last few games, like I said, the last five games, he'll I would argue even the last 10 games, even though he hasn't lit up the lamp in all of those games, he has been a force. He's been, he has been their best player and he's 38 years of age. Like I said, 46 away from Gretzky's record in 1,414 games. He has 848 goals. Unbelievable. 15 or 1,543 assists, man. Insane. 72 yeah. goals in the playoffs, by the way, too. Jeez. And they yeah. beat they beat Winnipeg. Oh, did they? Yeah. Charlie I, uh, Lind- Charlie Lindgren got the uh the shutout. They beat Winnipeg today three rip. That is huge. Yeah, they're on a two they're on a, a two game win streak. They're seven and three in their last ten, and they are r- only how many points behind the Flyers right now? Uh, they're three points back of the Philadelphia Flyers. You sit right above them in the Metro. So like it only really takes at this point, if they can even just play at this level, it, it just takes the Flyers kind of coming back down to earth a little bit in these last, uh, what, 10, 20 games yeah. for, for the Capitals to, to take them. A, so they're in a little bit of a skid themselves. They're four, four and two in their last 10. So it's not like they're playing their best hockey at this point in the season. Yeah. So it's. It's not out of the realm of possibility if Ovechkin keeps doing what he's doing and if they keep getting that goaltending. If Lindgren keeps that up, like... Yeah, big shout-out to him, man. That's It's awesome to see him step up this year and, and get that opportunity. Um, 100%. So there you go. If wild playoff watch you know, ends after a, a, a terrible loss, let's say, against the San Jose Sharks, and look, knock on oh. wood, we just kick the shit out of them. But at, at least there's a... At least there's like a one B team that you guys can, you know, as, as true hockey fans, you guys mm-hmm. can uh, can root for and and you know, I mean, fuck Philadelphia. I'd rather the Capitals, you know, make the playoffs in Philly. As much as I yeah. love Torts, and we'll talk about him on the next episode, because uh, Seth and I have some actual, uh, actually, uh, actually, a lot of positive things to say about John Tortorella. And if the Flyers 
make the playoffs, I think there's a big argument for him to be coach of the year. But we'll put that on the shelf for next week, Seth. And next week, guys, we are going to talk a little bit about and uh, and just so our respects, love, and support to the family and um, and friends of Chris Simon and Constantine Koltsov. We didn't have enough time to dive into it here today, and I don't want to just like rush through that segment. I want I want to give it the the time it deserves. So we're gonna put that on the shelf for next week as well. But uh, yeah, that that does it for this segment here, Seth. I don't know if you got anything else to add. You got anything else to add? Ah. Uh... We'll be uh, on Vegas watch the early part of this week. They play uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So oh, wow. the Wilds, the Wilds got to hope for zero and three before they match up with them on Saturday. But we'll find out. It's going to be uh, a fun game to uh, to watch as a as a hockey fan. But yeah. if you're a Wild fan, especially if the San Jose game is. Not one way traffic for the wild. If the wild just don't absolutely dominate them, it's uh, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be biting my nails for the whole, uh, whole Friday night and uh, Saturday morning. Dicey, dicey, dicey. Uh, Seth, as always, I appreciate you jumping on for this segment of the soda pod, man. Like I, I say this every week, but it's true. This is my favorite part of the week. Every Sunday and every Thursday, recording with Seth here. Um, every Monday, Soda Pod drops on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your podcasts from. And Seth's going to be riding with us for the remainder of the season for the summer. Just moving forward, we have a great partnership now, a great collaboration between the Soda Pod and Locked On Wild, and uh, it's always a blast jumping on your show every Thursday. Uh, what do you got coming up this week? As you're dropping shows left, right, and center every day, as you do on Locked On Wild. I'm uh, going back to the guest lineup this week. Uh, we've got some uh, old friends that are going to be hopping on. We'll talk a little Minnesota wild. We'll talk a little PWHL this week too. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll continue to keep you updated here uh, as the rest of the season unfolds. Hard to believe we've only got 11 games left of the regular crazy. season. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's crazy, man. Cause the time flies. It was like, like a few days ago, I was talking to people. I was like, yeah, there's like you know, 15, 16 games. And I was shoot, man, we're almost at 10 now. Just Yeah, we're we're in the two-minute warning, so to speak. If wow. For the NFL fans, we're in the two-minute warning. Unbelievable. As always, guys, go support Seth. Find him on YouTube. Find him wherever you get your podcast from Locked on Wild. Uh, last segment of the show next year. God, I say it every week, man. I say it every week. The best part of my week is linking up with Seth to do a soda pod episode and now twice a week as I jump on his Friday episode on Locked on Wild. So be sure to go check him out, Locked on Wild. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Go uh and if you again if you are a podcast, if you're an audio only person, you can find the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. And yours truly will be on every single Friday episode moving forward. That's it. That's the show. Before we wrap up, I just want to give a big shout out to our friends at Better Edge. Better Edge is my first choice as far as betting apps to use to bet on my favorite sports. Hockey, MMA. I mean, I've been crushing it with the UFC picks, ladies and gentlemen. So not a big deal. Hit me up if you want to make some money. And if you're looking for a great platform to sports bet in this state, the great state of Minnesota that doesn't allow sports betting, this is the legal way to do it. And if you want 20 bucks to play around with upon sign up, just to see if this app is the right one for you, go to betteredge.com slash Sota pod and you will get a $20 signing bonus to play around with. And I promise you will come back for more. We also host wild game day pickums, $5 entry pick seven out of 10 points. Those points include money line player point totals, etc. More competitions to come as a well throughout the playoffs and next season, free platform, legal betting, in and outside the state of Minnesota. 44 other states are using Better Edge right now. So get in on all the action. And if you're loving the app, if you've already burned through, doubled, tripled, quadrupled that $20 signing bonus and you want more from this platform, you can sign up as a premium member. That is right. Premium players have access to free entry to premium pick'em contests where you can win up to 100 bucks upon your first entry order grades, advanced order filtering, API access, and more. Details 
on a premium membership at betteredge.com slash premium. But before then, claim your $20 sign-up bonus by going to betteredge.com slash SOTAPOD. Better Edge, proud supporter, proud partner, proudly making money here on the Soda Pod. Like I said, big shout out to Seth, big shout out to Drecker Brewing, big shout out to all of our partners. You guys are amazing. And a special shout out to you guys, the viewers on YouTube and the listeners. We are inching towards our 400th episode, ladies and gentlemen. I've been doing this podcast for almost five years now, and it's truly an honor to have all you regular listeners, all you amazing now viewers on YouTube come back every week to listen to this crazy motherfucker talk about the sport that he loves and that is hockey if you are only an audio listener and you want to get the most out of this podcast i post it every day monday evening on youtube so go like and subscribe to our youtube channel our youtube channel has podcast clips and full video segments from all the podcasts under the soda pod umbrella mncaa judd's buds fellowship of the rink and of course yours truly the soda pod and especially if you want the full experience of the hoppy hour now the visual experience go check us out on youtube big shout out to you guys thank you so much for the support signing off i'm used to me alongside seth topol now moving forward with this amazing collaboration and partnership between the soda pod and locked on wild this has been the soda pod presented by our friends at better edge seventh avenue pizza northland vodka and waggle golf don't fear just drink some beer and stay wild